All right, so the common questions I found you all had. I'm not comfortable talking about where exactly I work, unfortunately. In all reality, some of the things I've mentioned here can get me in a lot of trouble or fired. So it's best if I don't discuss too much. I'll say that I'm in the United States and in an area that's comprised of a great deal of wilderness. They're talking hundreds of miles of thick forest with a mountain range and a few lakes. There's still a great amount of interest in the stairs. Um, lucky for you guys, my friend has a story I think you'll all be very interested in. I'll go into that much more at the end of this update. As for whether or not I have ever thought of asking my superiors about them, I have, but again, I don't want to risk my job. However, one of my former superiors no longer works as a search and rescue officer, and it's possible that he may be willing to tell me about it. I'll be speaking to him later in the week, and I'll let you all know what comes of that. As far as advice on being an SAR officer goes, I think the best advice I can give is to contact your local forest service office and see if they offer any training courses or what the qualifications are. See, I've been doing this for years. I started out as a volunteer helping on a search and rescue operation. This is a great job. I mean, despite the occasional tragic situation. I wouldn't want to do anything else. Okay, so let's move right into the stories. The first happened on a case that I went out on right after I got out of training. And I was still pretty new to everything. So before I took this job, I was a volunteer. So I had a basic idea of what to expect. See, but on those calls, you mostly dealing with finding lost people after vets have found signs of them. As a search and rescue officer, you go out for all kinds of cases, from animal bites to heart attacks. This case got called in early in the morning from a couple who went out on that trail that goes by the lake. The husband was completely hysterical. Couldn't really figure out what was going on. We could hear the woman screaming in the background and he was begging us to come up there right away. When we get there, we see him holding his wife. She's got something in her arm. She's, she's screaming these awful, almost animal-like screams. She's sobbing. He sees us and he's screaming at us to help them to please get an ambulance up there. Now, obviously, we can't just drive an ambulance up the walking path. So we ask him if his wife needs help, if she could walk on her own. He's still hysterical. But he manages to tell us that not his wife that needs help. I go over while one of the vets tries to calm him down. I ask his wife what's going on. She's rocking. She's holding something. I'm just shrieking over and over. I crouch down and I see that what she's holding is covered with her blood. That's why I noticed the sling on her front and my heart sank. I ask her, tell me what's going on. I sort of pry her arms gently open so I could see what she's holding. It's her baby obviously dead. His head is caved in on one side and he's covered in scratches. I've seen dead bodies before. Something about this whole situation just hits me hard. I have to take a second to compose myself. I get up, I go over to where one of the vets who's standing by, I tell him, I tell him that it's a dead kid. He sort of pats my shoulder, tells me that he'll deal with it. it. Took us over an hour to get this woman to let us see her kid. Every time we try to take him from her, she flips out and tells us we can't have him. That he'll be okay if we just leave her alone, let her help him. Eventually one of the vets calms her down. She gives us the body. We take it back to the med area, but when the EMT shows up, they told us that there was never any hope of saving the kid. He died instantly from the trauma to his head. I was, I was good buddies with one of the nurses. We met them at the hospital. She told me later what had happened. Turns out the couple had been walking with the baby in the sling. They stopped because the kid was fussing. Dad takes the kid and is holding him, looking out over his little 
gully by the path. A mom comes to stand next to him, but she ends up stepping on a loose patch of soil. She trips. She falls into the dad who drops the kid, who ends up falling about 20 feet down this little gully into the rocks at the bottom. The dad climbs down and recovers the kid, but he'd fallen right on his head. He's dead by the time then. By the time that he got there. The baby was only about 15 months old. It was a total freak accident, a series of events that coalesced into the worst possible outcome. It was probably one of the most awful calls I've ever been on. I haven't seen a lot of animal bites in my time as an SAR, mostly because there aren't that many animals that come around the area. Well, there are bears in the area. They tend to stay pretty far away from people. And sightings are highly unusual. Most of the animals you see are small ones, like coyotes, raccoons, or skunks. What we do see frequently, though, are moose. Let me tell you, moose are nasty fuckers. They, they'll chase after anything for any reason, and God help you if you get in between a female and its baby. One of the more amusing calls was of a guy who'd gotten chased down by... An absolutely massive male moose and was stuck up a tree. It took us almost an hour to get him down. And when he was finally on solid ground again, he looks at me and says, God damn, them fuckers are big up close. I guess that's not really a scary story. We still laugh about that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. I honestly, I don't know how I'd forgotten this story, but it is by far the scariest thing that's happened to me. I guess maybe. I've tried so long to forget about it. It just doesn't come to mind right away. As someone who spends literally all their time in the woods, you don't even want to let yourself get scared of, of being alone or out in the middle of nowhere. That's why when you have experiences like this, you tend to just forget about them. Move on. This is, to date, the only thing that's ever made me really seriously consider if this job is right for me. I don't really talk about it much, but I'll do the best I can to remember it all. As I recall, this took place right at the end of spring. It was a typical lost child call. A four-year-old girl had wandered away from her family campsite and been missing for about two hours. Her parents were completely despondent and told us what most parents do. My my kid would never wander away. She's so good about staying close. She's never done anything like this before. We assure the parents that we'll do anything we can to find her. We spread out. Standard search formation. I was partnered with one of my good buddies and we were sort of casually holding conversation while we hiked. I know it sounds callous, but like you do sort of become desensitized when you've done this long enough. It, it becomes the norm. I think to a, to a certain extent you have to learn to desensitize yourself in order to work this job. We searched for a good two hours, going well beyond where we think that she might be. And we come out of a small valley when something makes us both stop in unison. We freeze. And we look at each other and there's almost a sensation like a like a, a plane depressurizing. My ears pop. I have this odd sensation of having dropped about 10 feet. I start to ask my buddy if he felt that. Before I can, we hear the loudest sound I have ever heard in my life. It's like a freight train passing by us. But it's coming from every direction all at once, including above and below us. He screams something to me, but I, I can't hear him over this deafening roar. Understandably freaked out, we all look around us trying to find the source of the sound, but neither of us sees anything. Of course, my first thought is a landslide. We're not near any cliffs. I mean, and even if we were, it would have hit us by now. Sound goes on and on, we're all trying to yell to each other, but even standing close together, we can't hear anything but the sound. Then as suddenly as it starts, it stops. Like someone threw a switch and cut it off. We stand there for a second, perfectly still, and slowly, the normal sounds of the woods come back. He asked me what the fuck just happened. 
But I just kind of shrug. We, we stand there looking at each other for a minute. I get on the radio. I ask if anyone else just heard the end of the fucking world, but no one else hears it. Even though we're all within shouting distance of each other, my buddy and I just sort of shrug it off and keep going. About an hour later, we, we all check up on the radios. No one's found the little girl. Most of the time, we won't search when it gets dark, but because we don't have any kind of lead on her, a few of us decide to keep going, including me and my buddy. We keep close together. They're calling out for her every couple of minutes. At this point, I'm hoping beyond hope that we find her, because while I may not like kids, the idea of them being out all alone in the dark is awful. The woods can be intimidating to kids, and that's in the daytime, at night. Well, it's a whole different beast. But we're not seeing any signs of her, getting any responses. And around midnight, we decide to turn around and head back to the rendezvous point. We're about halfway back when my buddy stops and shines his light to the right of us into a really thick group of dead trees, and I ask him if he heard a response. He just tells me to be quiet a second and listen. I do. And in the distance, I can hear what sounds like a, a kid crying. We both call the girl's name and listen for any kind of response, but it's, it's just this really faint crying. We head in the distance, this deadfall, and go around it, calling her name over and over. And as we get closer, I start getting this weird feeling in my gut, and I tell my buddy that something isn't right. He tells me he feels the same way. We can't figure out what it is. We stop where we are, call the girl's name again, and at the same time, we both figure it out. The crying is on a loop. It's the same little hitching sob, then wail, and quiet hiccup, repeated over and over. It's exactly the same every time, and without saying another word, we both take off running. It's, it's the only time I've ever lost my composure, and like that, Something about it was so incredibly wrong. Neither of us wanted to stay out there anymore. When we got back to the rendezvous, we asked if anyone else had heard anything strange, but no one knew what we were talking about. I know it sounds like sort of uh, an anticlimactic thing, but that call fucked me up for a long time. As for the little girl, we never found a trace of her. To keep an eye out for her, and all the other people that we've never found, but frankly, frankly, I doubt we'll ever find anything. Of the missing person calls I've gone on, only a handful have ever resulted in a complete disappearance, meaning no trace of the person and nobody ever found, but sometimes finding a body just leads to more questions than answers. Here's some of the bodies we found that have become infamous in our team. A teenage boy whose remains were recovered almost a year after he vanished. We found the top of his skull, two finger bones, and his camera almost 40 miles from where he was last seen. And the camera was sadly destroyed. The pelvis of an older man who had vanished a month earlier. That was all we found. The lower jaw and right foot of a two-year-old boy on the highest peak of a ridge in the southern part of the park. The boy of a 10-year-old girl with Down syndrome, almost 20 miles from where she'd vanished. She had died of exposure three weeks after going missing, and after all of her clothes were intact except for her shoes and jacket. There were berries and cooked meat in her stomach when they did the autopsy. The coroner said it appeared as if someone had been taking care of her. There were no suspects ever identified. The frozen body of a one-year-old baby Found a week after vanishing in the hollow trunks of a tree ten miles from the area he'd last been seen. There was fresh milk found in his stomach, but his tongue was gone. A single vertebra and right kneecap of a three-year-old girl found in the snow almost twenty miles from the campground her family had been in the previous summer. 
now on to a couple of the stories my friend had told me. I mentioned that you were all interested in the stairs, and you're in luck because he's had a closer encounter with them. Though he doesn't have any explanation from them, he does have a bit more experience with them than I do. My buddy has been a search and rescue officer for about seven years. He started when he was in junior college, and he had a very similar experience when he first encountered the stairs. His trainer told him almost the same thing mine did, which was never go near him, don't touch him, don't ascend them. For the first year, he did just that. But apparently, his curiosity got the better of him, and on one call, he broke away from the line and went to go check a set of them out. He said that they were about 10 miles from the path where a teenage girl had vanished, and the dogs were following a scent. He was on his own. He was lagging behind the main group when he saw a set of stairs off to his left. They looked like they were from a new house because the carpet was pristine and white. He said that he had gotten closer. He didn't feel any different or hear any weird noises. He was expecting something to happen, like bleeding from his ears, collapsing. But he got right up next to him and he didn't feel anything. The only thing he said that was odd was that there was absolutely no debris on the steps. There was no dirt. No leaves, dust, anything, and there didn't appear to be any signs of animal or insect activity in the immediate area, which he found strange. It was less like things were avoiding them, and more like they just happened to be in a relatively barren part of the forest. He touched the stairs, and he didn't feel anything except that sort of sticky feeling you get from a new carpet. Making sure his radio was on, he slowly climbed the stairs. He said that it was terrifying. Because the way they'd been stigmatized, he wasn't really sure what was going to happen to him. He joked that half of him expected to be teleported to some other dimension, and the other half was watching for a UFO to come swooping down, but he got to the top with little event. And he stood there looking around. But he said the longer he stood on the top step, the more he felt like he was doing something very very wrong. He described it as the feeling you'd get when you were on part of the government building that you had no business being in. As if someone was going to come and arrest you or shoot you in the back of the head any second. He tried to brush it off. But the feeling got stronger and stronger and that's when he realized that he couldn't hear anything anymore. The sounds of the forest were gone. He couldn't hear his own breathing. It was like some kind of weird, awful tinnitus, but more oppressive. He climbed back down and rejoined the search and didn't mention what he'd done. But he said the weirdest part came after. His trainer was waiting back at the welcome center after the search ended for the day, and he cornered my buddy before he could leave. He said his trainer had this look of intense anger. He asked what was wrong. You went up there, didn't you? My buddy said it wasn't phrased as a question. He asked how his trainer knew. The trainer just shook his head. Because we didn't find her. The dogs lost her scent. The trainer asked how long my buddy had been on the stairs, and my, my buddy said no more than a minute. The trainer gave him this really awful, almost dead-eyed look. Told him that if he ever went up another set of stairs again, he'd be fired. Immediately. The trainer walked away, and I... I guess he never answered any of the questions my buddy asked him about it ever since. My buddy had been involved in a lot of missing persons cases where there had never been a trace of them. I mean, I mentioned David and my, my buddy said that he, he can confirm that those stories are, for the most part, accurate. He said that most of the time, if the person isn't found right away, they're either... Well, never found. Or they're found weeks, months, or years later in places they couldn't possibly have gone to. One story he told me really stood out that involved a five-year-old boy with a severe mental disability. A little boy vanished from a picnic area in the late fall. In addition to the mental disability, he was also physically handicapped, and his parents explained over and over that he simply could not have vanished. It was impossible. Someone had to have taken him. My buddy said they searched for the kid for weeks going miles out of the accepted range, but it was like... It was like he'd never been there. 
The dogs didn't pick up his scent anywhere, not even in the picnic area where he'd apparently vanished from. Suspicion fell on the parents, but it was pretty clear that they were devastated, hadn't done anything sinister to their kid. The search was concluded about a month later, and my buddy said everyone had pretty much forgotten it by later in the winter. He was out on a training op in the snow, and one of those higher peaks when he came across something. He said he saw it from far away at first. When he got closer, he realized it was a shirt, frozen and sticking partway out of the powder. He realized it belonged to the kid because it had a distinct pattern. About 20 yards away, he found the kid's body, laying partially buried in the snow. My bud said that there was no way the kid had been dead for any more than a few days, even though he'd been missing for almost three months. And the kid was curled around something. My bud brushed off the snow to see what it was. He said he almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was, a, it was a big chunk of ice. One that had been carved crudely into the shape like a like a person. The kid was holding it so tight it had frostbitten in his chest and hands. Which my buddy could tell even with the decay that had taken place. He radioed the rest of the crew. They took the body off the mountain. He, he recapped all this to me. To put it simply, there was no way this kid could have survived for almost three months on his own. Or even gotten to this peak. There was no physical way this child could have walked almost 50 miles and end up on the top of a goddamn mountain. To top it off, there was nothing in the kid's stomach or colon. Nothing. Not even water. It was like... My buddy said the kid had taken off the face of the earth, put in suspended animation, and dropped on this mountain months later only to die of exposure. He's, he's never really gotten over that one. And the last story I'll share from him was one that took place relatively recently, only a few months ago. They were out doing a recon for mountain lions because there have been several reports of sightings in the last couple of days. One of our jobs is to scout out the areas where these animals have been seen to endure that if they are in the area, we can warn people and close off the trails. He was out on his own in a very heavily forested part of the park towards dusk when he heard what sounded like a woman screaming in the distance. Now, as most of you know, when a mountain lion screams, it, it sounds almost exactly like a woman being brutally murdered. It's unsettling. But far from unnormal. My buddy radioed back and let Ops know what he'd heard, and that he was going to keep going to see if he could figure out where its territory started. He heard the mountain lion scream a couple more times, always from the same spot, and determined the approximate area of the mountain lion's territory. He was about to head back when he heard another scream. This time only within a few yards of him. Of course, he freaks out and starts heading back at a much faster pace because the last thing he wants is to run into a goddamn mountain lion and get mauled to death. So as he got back on the path and starts going up, screaming followed him. He broke into a jog. When he was about a mile from Ops, the screaming stops. He turned around to see if he was followed. It was almost night by this point, but he said in the distance, just, just before the path rounded a corner, he could see what looked like a male figure. He called out to them, warning them the path was closed. And he just stood there. And my buddy started to walk over. When he was about ten yards away, the figure took, as he described, an impossibly long step toward him and let out the same scream that my buddy had been hearing. My buddy didn't even say anything. He just turned and sprinted back to Ops, never looking behind him. By the time he got back, the screaming had moved back into the woods. He didn't mention it to anyone. He just said that there was a mountain lion in the area. And they would need to close those paths until the animal could be located and moved. And KD. KD is a vet who's been an SAR officer for about 15 years. She specializes in high elevation mountain risk and is widely considered one of the best in her field. She was one of the more enthusiastic storytellers, and since we were together a fair amount during exercises, she ended up telling me about 
four that really stuck with me. The first she told me, in response to me asking about her most traumatic calls, she shook her head and told me that really bad calls happen more frequently on the mountain since the potential for nasty accidents is higher. About five years ago, one of the parks she worked at had a string of disappearances. It was a bad year, she said. One of the worst on record as far as weather went. They were getting about a foot of new snow every couple of days, and there were a few avalanches that killed some climbers. They'd warn people about staying on the mapped areas, but of course, there's always those who don't listen. In particularly nasty cases, an entire family gets wiped out because the father decided he knew better than the officials. And he took them out into an area that isn't safe. They were snowshoeing. And as best as KD could figure, they walked onto a shelf of snow that looked solid. It actually wasn't. It gave way. And this family went ass over tea kettle almost 300 feet on a slope. They landed on the rocks at the bottom and the parents died instantly. One of the kids did as well, but the other two survived. One had a broken leg, fractured his ribs, and the other was almost unharmed save for some bruising and a sprained ankle. The uninjured child left his sibling behind and set out to find help. Katie said the kid didn't make it more than a half mile before a storm overtook him. The kid stopped to try and get warm, maybe just to rest. Ended up freezing to death. They ended up finding the entire family with the help of some witnesses who saw them heading out into the wilderness she was the one to find the kid who froze to death just looking for help. She said, It started snowing just enough to obscure long distance vision, but not enough to make searching impossible. She saw a figure sitting in the snow up ahead. And she got to it as quickly as possible. She described in detail how, as she got closer, she realized first that it was a child. Second, that it was deceased. And third, that it was frozen in one of the most pitiful positions she'd ever found a corpse in. The kid was sitting upright with his knees tucked up under his chest. His arms were curled around them. His head was tucked up in his coat. When she moved the coat to look at his face, she saw that he died crying. His face was twisted. The tears were frozen on his cheeks. She said it was... It was painfully obvious that the kid was terrified and he succumbed to hypothermia. And as a mother, it broke her heart. She told me repeatedly that she hoped the father was burning in hell as... She spoke. The other traumatic story that she told me that stood out in her mind was one that happened when she was a rookie. Her team got a report of an experienced climber who hadn't come home the previous day. His wife was convinced that something bad had happened because he never failed to come home on time. They went out looking for him and had to climb what sounded like some very technically challenging parts of the mountain. They got to a severely flat area and Katie started seeing blood in the snow. As she followed the trail, and as she went, she started seeing little bits of tissue. She wasn't sure exactly what body part it had come from, but the farther she followed it, the more there was. She follows this blood and tissue trail to a sheltered area under a cliff face. She finds the climber. She said there was so much blood, more than she'd ever seen before. He was lying face down, one arm stretched in front of him, as if he died crawling. She looks closer and sees that he's been partially disemboweled, which is where the tissue she'd seen him come from. The guy has an ice pick tucked into a hip holster and is covered in blood. Of course, they'll never be sure exactly what happened, but she said as best as she can figure, this is what went down. 
the guy had been attempting to climb up the next area and had been using the ice axe to ascend. He's probably hit a loose patch. He had fallen on the way down or possibly when he landed, he had gotten impaled by the axe and it had disemboweled him. He drug himself along, tearing pieces of himself as he went. And he died under the cliff face. She isn't terribly bothered by gore, but I guess a few of the guys who came to help her remove the body threw up. And they turned him over. And a good portion of his intestines had spilled out. Now, I had mentioned to her that I was interested in hearing about any experiences she had with people completely disappearing. And her eyes lit up. She leans in close to me. Want to hear a real doozy, she asks. She tells me about how, when she first started, it was a case that got a lot of attention in the media. A family had been out berry picking in an area of the forest very close to the entrance of the park. They had two little boys, both under the age of five, and at some point during the day, one of them vanishes. There's an absolutely massive search. They find nothing. It's another of those cases where it's like the kid was never there in the first place. The dogs just sit down, they don't pick up on anything, no trace of the kid is found. The search goes on for about two months, but is eventually called off. Fast forward to six months later. The family comes back to place flowers at a memorial that's been set up for the kid. They bring their other son. While they're placing the flowers, they lose sight of the kid for about three seconds, and in that span of time, he vanishes into thin air. Now, obviously, the parents are beyond devastated. It's awful enough to lose one child, but to lose two is beyond imagining. The search is huge. One of the largest in state history. There's about 300 volunteers combining every inch of this peak looking for the kid. But again, there's no trace of him. The search goes on for about a week with people looking miles from the part of the park where he's vanished from. And then, almost two weeks later, a volunteer almost 15 miles from the designated search area radios in that he's found the kid. Now, they assume that the kid is dead. But the volunteer says he's not only alive, he's in good shape. KD and her team go out to recover the kid, and when they get there, she can't believe that this kid that's been missing, his clothes are clean, there's no dirt on him anywhere, he doesn't appear traumatized. The volunteer says he found the kid sitting on a log, playing with a little twig bundle that's bound together with some old rope. KD asks him where he's been, who he's been with for those two weeks. And the kid tells her that he's been with the fuzzy man. No, KD firmly believes in Bigfoot. So she gets all excited and asks what he means by fuzzy. Was he hairy? But he describes that man is blurry. Like when you close your eyes, but not all the way closed. He says the man came out of the trees, took the kid with him deep into the woods. The kid says he slept in a hollow tree. And the fuzzy man gave him berries to eat. Katie asks the man was mean. If he if he scared the kid. The kid says no. He wasn't scared. But I didn't like how he didn't have eyes. Katie says they get the kid back to the headquarters. Cop takes him into town, talks to him more about what happened. She's friends with the cop that talked to him. She says the kid described being kept in this tree by the fuzzy man, given berries whenever he was hungry. He was allowed to wander around a very specific clearing, but when he tried to go further, the fuzzy man would get mad and yell real loud, even though he didn't have a mouth. When the kid got scared at night, the fuzzy man made it go brighter. Gave him the twig bundle. He said the fuzzy man was going to keep him. But he had to let him go because the kid wasn't the right kind. He either can't or won't elaborate more than that. The cops are sort of just left scratching their heads, and the search for his brother is renewed with new results. The kid has no idea where his brother might be, and they never find him. 
the last story that KD told me was something that happened to her when she got separated from her training group when she was a rookie. They were learning the basics of high elevation, but laid on a well-mapped side of the mountain. And she had to use the bathroom. She goes off about 15 yards from the group during a meal break, did her business, and I'll tell you the rest exactly as she told me. So I go to take a piss. Once I'm done, I start going back to the group. But I've only gotten about five feet when I realize that I have no idea where I am. And this wasn't an, oh, I got turned around and lost. I mean, I literally had no clue where I was. If you ask me, I don't even think I've... I'd have been able to tell you what state we were in. Sort of how I imagine people with amnesia feel, you know? You're completely lost. You have no idea what to do. So I stood there for a while, just trying to figure out where the hell I was and what I was supposed to do. But the longer I stand there, the more confused and turned around I get. So I start walking. As I recall, I just... I picked a random direction and went for it. And as I'm walking, it's just getting worse and worse to the point where I have no concept of why I'm on the mountain in the first place. I'm just trudging through the snow. Then I start hearing this voice. Kind of inside my head, almost. Like if a frog could talk, all low and croaky. And it's telling me over and over, It's okay. You just need to find something to eat. Find something to eat and you'll be okay. Just keep walking. Find something to eat. 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 So I start looking around for anything I can eat. I swear to God, I've never felt so hungry in my whole life. It was bottomless. I think I had eaten just about anything you put in front of me right then. I had no concept of time. I had no idea how long it had been. When I hear an actual voice coming towards me, I go toward it and I see one of the other SARs. He looks fucking terrified. He's running towards me asking if I'm okay, what the hell I'm doing out here. And and the scary thing is, he's running toward me. I kind of see myself reaching into my belt for my hunting knife. Not even really thinking about what I'm doing, but... What I'm thinking is that I have to eat. If I don't eat, I'll never be okay again, so I just... I just have to eat. He sees me doing that and he backs off right away. He yells at me to put my knife away and that's... That he's not gonna hurt me. It kind of snaps me back. All of a sudden, I know exactly where I am. I put the knife away. I run to him. I ask him how long I've been gone. Thinking that he'll tell me about half an hour or so, he tells me that I've been gone for two fucking days. I've gone over two peaks and ended up almost on the other side of the mountain. And if I'd kept going, I would have ended up wandering into about 300 miles of wilderness. They'd never have found me. He can't believe I'm not dead. And of course, I don't know what the fuck to think. To me, no time had passed at all. I don't I don't say anything. I just go back with him to a rendezvous point and I'm I'm taken back to HQ to be airlifted to the hospital. When I get there, they do all kinds of tests. I try to figure out what happened. As best they can guess, I had some kind of weird fatigue state, which is kind of like amnesia or A weird seizure that knocked my brain out of whack. But the truth is that we don't really know. It's never happened again, but I'll tell you. Ever since then, I never go out there alone. People rag on me for making them come with me when I have to leave the group. I just tell them that listening to me piss in the snow is better than losing me. For two days on a freezing mountain. EW. The next person I talked with was EW, a former trainer who now works as an EMT. He still comes to ops like this to help out, but he doesn't work full time for us anymore. He's specialized in finding lost kids. He just seemed to have a sixth sense when it came to knowing where they'd gone. He's a legend amongst more of the senior vets, but he gets embarrassed if you compliment him on his work. He sat down with me at dinner one evening. Ended up swapping stories. Most of them were just casual, but when when we got to the subject of our weirder calls, I mentioned that 
I'd had a buddy who'd gone up a set of stairs. He got kind of quiet, and he asked me if I'd heard of a little boy who disappeared from his park a few years back. I hadn't. So he told me this story. They were out looking for this 11-year-old boy, Joey. He'd gone missing near a river. Of course, the first thought was that he'd fallen in and drowned, but they, they brought out dogs. And they led the SAR officers away from the river and up into a very densely forested area. Now, when we do searches for people, we search in a grid pattern. We search every box of the grid incredibly thoroughly. What EW's team noticed right away was that a very strange pattern was emerging. Dogs in alternating boxes were picking up Joey's scent, but losing it when they overlapped with another box. Now, if you think of a checkerboard, Joey's scent was being picked up in random black squares, but never in red. This, of course, didn't make any sense, because how could the kid bounce from area to area without leaving a scent in each place that he passed? E.W. and his partner pass into a new box of the grid. E.W. notices a set of stairs about 50 yards away. He tells his partner that they need to go check near it, but his partner flat out refuses. He tells E.W. that he's made it a point never to go near any stairs. He says that while it may be routine, he's not to pretend that it's normal. He tells E.W. that he'll wait in sight while E.W. checks. E.W. says he's irritated, but he felt for the guy and didn't push him on the subject. I walked over to the stairs. They were small, kind of like stairs to a basement. I don't really feel strongly one way or the other about them. The stairs, I mean, so I wasn't scared or anything. I guess I'm like everyone else. I just prefer not to think about them too much. Anyway, I went over, and I could see that there was something lying on the bottom step. So it curled up. My heart sinks, because, of course, always yell for the best, and we're confident that we'd found this kid alive, but he'd only been missing a few hours. But I knew right away that it was him. He was dead. He was curled up in a little ball on the step holding his stomach. It looked like he'd been in horrible pain when he died, but I didn't see any blood except some of his lips and, and some on his chin. I radioed in that I'd found him. They got his body back to command, the poor family. They are devastated. The, the parents couldn't understand how he'd been dead. He'd only been gone for such a short amount of time. But on top of that, we didn't have any obvious cause of death. Which made it worse. They figured he'd probably eaten something poisonous. Since he was holding his stomach when we found him. But I, I didn't want to guess. It's hard enough to hear that your kid's dead, let alone some stupid SAR guy guessing about what happened. They took him away. I went home, tried not to think about it. I hate finding dead kids, man. I, I love this job. But it's one of the reasons why I left. I got two daughters. I thought of losing them that way. He choked up a little bit here. I'm not great with emotional stuff like that. And the, it's always sort of awkward seeing a grown man cry, so I didn't really know what to do. He, he pulled himself together eventually, though, and he kept going. We don't always hear back from the coroners about cause of death. Not really our job to know, I guess, and sometimes if they think it's foul play, they won't tell us. And some kind of legal bullshit. But I got a friend who works for the sheriff's department. They usually pass along any interesting info if I ask. In this case, though, I actually got a call from him about a week later. He asked if I remember the kid, and of course I do. He says something serious. Some weird shit that's going on here. He tells me, E.W., man, you're going to think I'm crazy, but the coroner has no idea what happened to this kid. Never seen anything like it. My friend goes on to tell me. that When the coroner opened the kid up, he couldn't even believe what he was seeing. The kid's organs were like Swiss cheese. Quarter-sized holes were punched clean through just about it. Every single organ that kid had, aside from his heart and lungs. But his colon, his stomach, his kidneys, even one of his testicles were 
full of these clean holes. My friend in the corner described it as if someone had taken a hole punch and punched holes out of everything. They were so neat. But the kid didn't have a scratch on him, no entry or exit wounds. The closest anyone had ever seen like it was a guy who filled himself full of buckshot a year or so back while cleaning his rifle. No one had a clue what could have possibly caused it. My friend asked me if I'd ever heard of anything like it. or We'd had something like that. I told him I wasn't going to be a part of any help to him. As far as I know, the coroner determined the cause of death as something like like massive internal bleeding. But no one knows what really happened. I've never been able to forget that kid. I have nightmares about it sometimes. I don't... I'll let my kids go into the woods alone. When we go together, I never let them out of my sight. I used to love it out here. But that case, a couple others just sort of ruined it for me. The dinner was over, so we started to clean up and go back to our cabins. But before we went our separate ways, he put his hand on my shoulder and looked at me real close. Tells me that bad things out there. Things that don't care if we we have families, if we live or we die. Or that we can think or feel. He tells me to be careful. He walks away. I didn't have a chance to talk with him again. That story stuck with me. P.B. By pure coincidence, I got to talk with another vet, P.B., who's been on the SAR field for years. We were partnered on a grim sweep during a training exercise. We were chatting casually about how we liked the job, what kind of things we'd seen and like. At one point, we passed an old set of stairs, though these are probably from an um, old fire lookout. Given the area that we were in, I sort of casually mentioned that I was curious about the stairs and that I wished I knew more about them. He got kind of quiet. It looked like like he wanted to tell me something. I wasn't sure if he should. Finally, he told me to turn off my radio. Obviously, this is something that we never, ever are supposed to do. But I did. We did the same. About seven years ago, he tells me, he was out on a call with a rookie. They were in an area of the park that had a lot of strange reports and events, disappearances, stories about lights in the forest, odd noises, things like that. The rookie was totally spooked. He kept going on and on about things out in the woods, according to PB, the guy. The guy wouldn't stop talking about the goat man. Just go on and on, and goat man this, goat man that, finally. I told him that there was plenty else to be afraid of out here that was very real. And that he'd, he'd be better off getting over this thing with the goat man. The rookie wanted to know what kinds of things I was talking about. And I just told him to shut up and walk. And we crested a little ridge and there was a staircase about ten yards ahead. The kid stops dead in his tracks. He just stands there looking at them. And tell him, see? That's something you should be afraid of. The rookie asked me what the hell those things are doing out here, and for some reason I just open up and tell him the truth. What I've been told is the truth. I could have gotten in a lot of trouble for doing what I did, and I I get in a lot of trouble for repeating it to you, but you're a nice kid. I I want you to stop looking into this. Quit while you're ahead, you know. So I'll tell you what I know, under the condition that you never breathe a word of this to the soups. I tell him I wouldn't say a word. Double checks that our radios are off. When I first started out, a little less tight-lipped about them. The other thing that happened out there, they warned people before they were ever hired. There was weird shit going on. I guess the Forest Service was just tired of having such a massive turnover rate, and they, they wanted people to know what they were getting into, so they started having people sign these agreements. They wouldn't go into the media about what they were going to see. The FS didn't want to scare people away, 
So the last thing they need were spooked rookies running off to the media with stories of ghosts and haunted stairs, but eventually they found that the agreements weren't necessary. People not only didn't want to talk about what they saw, they wouldn't. A few times, the media tried to talk to people when kids or hikers would disappear. No one would say a word. Can't really explain it, I guess. We just didn't really want to admit anything was wrong. This is our job. Beyond the woods every single day. We don't need to be spooked, and the best way to avoid that is to... Well, pretend like everything's okay. So I'll, I'll tell you everything I can of it. And after that, I'm done talking about it for good. I expect you not to bring it up to anyone around me. Ever. The stairs have been out here for as long as the parks have existed. They had records going back decades describing them. Sometimes people go up them, and then it happens other times. But look, I really don't like talking about this, but sometimes really, really bad shit happens. I saw one guy get his hand sliced clean off when he got to the top step. Reached out to touch a tree branch and it happened so fast. The second his hand was there and the next it was gone. Completely clean wound. We didn't find his hand. And the guy almost died. Another time a woman touched one of the stairs, a blood vessel in her brain exploded, literally just exploded like a water balloon. She sort of stumbled down, came over to me, and all she got out was, I think something's wrong with me. She dropped like a sack of flour dead before she hit the ground. I'll never forget the way the blood leaked to the inside of her eye before she died. I watched it turn red. I watched it happen and there wasn't a single thing I could do to wasn't a single thing I could do to help. We warn people not to go anywhere near them. There's always at least one idiot who does. And even if nothing happens to them, something bad always happens. Kids go missing. We're on their trail. Someone dies the next day, cut in half in a completely safe part of the park. I don't know why, but something bad always happens. I don't know exactly why they're out here, but it doesn't matter. They're here. For smart, it's all I knew officers exactly what they're capable of. We were both quiet for a little while. I was afraid to talk because I wasn't sure if he was done. He looked like he wanted to say something else. Finally, he spoke again. You ever notice how you can't find the same ones twice? I nodded, expecting him to continue, but he just stayed quiet. Walking alongside me, and eventually, he started a story about the biggest deer he'd ever seen in the park. I didn't bring it up again. I didn't press him for any more stories. He dropped out of the op the next day. Apparently, he left before the sun came up. He said he was sick. None of us had heard from him since he left. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here for the time being. I'll try and post the next part in the coming days, but... What with it being the end of summer, things are pretty busy here. Thanks for the continued interest, guys. You've really awakened this curiosity in me that I didn't know I had. Till next time. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. I hope you enjoyed tonight's story, and thank you all for listening. Please help support the channel at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and make sure to tune in for new horror stories every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday night. Many of the horror authors that I've worked with throughout this channel have all come together to work on one big book series, The Creepypasta Collections Volume 1 and 2. Check them out on Amazon or at any local bookstore near you. Thanks for listening, kids, and sweet dreams. <laughs>